Counting on Catherine Written by Helene Becker Illustrated by Dal Fomyrick Catherine loved to count. She counted the steps to the road, the steps up to church, the number of dishes and spoons she washed in the bright white sink. The only thing she didn't count were the stars in the sky. Only a fool, she thought, would try that. Even so, the stars sparked her imagination. What was out there? Catherine yearned to know as much as she could about numbers, about the universe, about everything. Catherine's boundless curiosity turned her into a star student. She was so bright, she skipped three whole grades. She catapulted right past her brother. He wasn't too happy about that. By the time she turned 10, Catherine was ready for high school. But back then, America was legally segregated by race. Her town's high school didn't admit black students of any age. Catherine burned with fury. She wanted more than anything to keep learning. So there was still so much to know. Count on me, Catherine's father told her. By working day and night, he earned enough money to move the family to a town with a black high school. Catherine loved high school. She was good at every subject, but math was still her favorite. She dreamed of becoming a research mathematician, making discoveries about the number patterns that are the foundations of our universe. In those days, there were no jobs as research mathematicians for women. Professions most available to them were teaching and nursing. So Catherine became an elementary school teacher. She liked her job and she loved her students, but she never stopped dreaming about exploring numbers. In the 1950s, the US government's National Advisory Committee on Aeronomics hired thousands of new employees. It even started hiring black women as mathematicians. Catherine heard about the mathematician's job. Her heart raced with excitement. Perhaps her dream could come true after all. But when she applied for one of the positions, she was told they were already filled. Catherine had to wait a whole year until new spots opened up. Her patience paid off. She got the job. A few years later, the Soviet Union sent a rocket ship into space, launching a space race with the United States. NACA was rolled into a new space agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Catherine now found herself at the heart of American space program. She worked as a computer. Electronic computers were not widely used yet calculating long series of numbers. All the computers were women. They were given the tasks that men thought were boring and unimportant. That didn't bother Catherine. She knew that without her contributions, a spaceship couldn't reach its destination, nor safely return to Earth. Here's why. 
Sending a rocket ship into space is like throwing a ball into the air. At first, the force of the throw sends the ball up, up, up. But as its energy runs out, the ball's path curves back down towards the ground. Where it lands depends on the angle it was thrown and how high and how fast it flew. Because math is a kind of language, Catherine could ask those questions. How high would the rocket ship go? And how fast would it travel using numbers? And numbers would provide the all important answer. Where would it land? To find out, Catherine plotted the numbers she calculated on a graph. When she joined the points together, they formed a curved line. At one end of the line was the Earth at the time the rocket ship launched. At the other was where Earth would be when the ship landed. Catherine's reputation for accuracy and strong leadership skills got her promoted to Project Mercury, a new program designed to send the first American astronauts into space. Mercury's missions were going to be dangerous. So dangerous that even the project's star astronaut, John Glenn, refused to fly unless Catherine okayed the numbers. You can count on me, she said. Glenn's spacecraft, Friendship 7, orbited Earth three times and returned home safely. Glenn became a national hero. Catherine was promoted again. Now, she was asked to calculate the flight paths for Project Apollo, the first flights to the moon. Count on me, she said. On July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 astronauts walked on the moon. Their feat was celebrated around the world. More triumphs followed. Apollo 12 rocketed to the moon in November 1969. Apollo 13 launched on April 11, 1970. But on the third day of Apollo 13's flight, the worst thing happened. An explosion in space. Could the crippled spaceship make it to the moon? And if it didn't, would it be able to get back home to Earth? Three astronauts on board were in grave peril. Commander Jim Lovell told Mission Control, Houston, we have a problem. Back on Earth, Katherine Johnson got a phone call. Her flight path calculations would have to be done all over again and perfectly. It would be the toughest challenge of her life. Katherine told Mission Control, you can count on me. She rolled up her sleeves, took a deep breath, and began doing the math. She worked hard and fast. A few hours later, Catherine's calculations were finished. The flight path to return home would take the ship around the far side of the moon. From there, the moon's gravity would act like a slingshot to zing the ship back to Earth. To get home, the crew of Apollo 13 would have to follow Catherine's course exactly by burning off fuel at precise intervals. If the astronauts made a mistake, their ship would drift through space forever. Catherine waited anxiously to hear the astronauts report. Finally, it crackled over the loudspeakers. We've got it. Apollo 13 was back on track. Katherine Johnson had done it. She brought Apollo 13 home. She was no longer the kid who dreamed of what lay beyond the stars. She was now a star herself. <laughs>